Thanks for clicking on Wayne.com for this week's edition of Inside the Zone alongside Justin Kenny of Optimum Performance Sports. Hey! I'm Glenn Marini, and man, it is week five this Friday. After yeah. this Friday, we are more than half done with the nine-week regular season, which is crazy. And we have got some really key conference matchups yeah. this week, and that starts with the NE8. We've been talking about it all season. Will it come down to week five? The first four weeks have only made it seem more clear yes. that it's going to be East Noble Leo for the conference championship. Gaming Kendallville this coming Friday. How do you see this one playing out based on what you've seen over the last four weeks? Well, I think both teams have been dominant uh, through their first seven games. You know, East Noble missing one of those, you know, due to, to COVID. So, uh, realistically, like, you know, so many people are going to say run games are similar, defense similar. I think it comes down to which quarterback makes the plays. And they may only have to make one or two plays with how dominant the run game is, but I think it's going to come down to Jackson Barber making a play or Xander Brazel making a play, and I feel like the quarterbacks could be the difference of which way this one goes. And Xander Brazel, I think you saw how run-heavy that East Noble was in that opener against Plymouth. Um, they seem to loosen it up a little bit yeah, more right? over around. the last couple of weeks, and maybe that's opponent-based or scheme-based or game-plan-based, but... I've been impressed. You've seen the growth, I yeah. think, from Xander Brazel over the last few weeks. Yeah, they've kind of let him, you know, take the, the reins off him a little bit, especially this past week, you know, throwing for, what, four, three or four touchdowns, ran mm -hmm. for another. Um, it was that game that you looked at to say, okay, I think he's capable of making some big plays. Jackson Barber not throwing it as much, but had a couple throws, you know, on a two-point conversion and stuff, mm -hmm. and I know people are going to gloss over it. But still, those throws on the highlights – courtesy of Wayne TV, were Boom. pretty good throws, right? Mm -hmm. He had to make, he had to sling it in there a little bit. So I think both quarterbacks are capable of making the plays, and I think to beat the other, they're going to have to because the defenses for these two teams are very, very good. I know people are going back to what East Noble did against Leo last year in mm -hmm. the sectional. Can East Noble get those stops again in the run game and force Jackson Barber to beat them? Yeah, last year, I mean, it was a complete flip of the script yeah. from week five to the sectional championship game. Leo wins in week five, 17 to zero. And then East Noble, I mean, it's a 27 point swing yeah. when they win 10 0 in the postseason. What was it about East Noble that maybe they figured out um, that they can apply this time around? Because, I mean, like I said, you go from giving up 17 to Leo to shutting them out in a sectional yeah. championship game. You, you figured something out defensively. It's all about figuring out that T formation and where, which direction the, get, the ball is going to go. And just the principles of the offense that Leo does is they like to run some counters, like to run misdirection, like to run end, end around, maybe some zone read in there. So a lot of different things that I think East Noble was able to identify after playing the first game last year and adjust. Now, if you're Leo and he's Noble, how are you game planning? If you're Leo, you're going, okay, we have to change things up from last year. Mm -hmm. In the sectional, what do we do different? And then East Noble, you're thinking, what do we prepare for? Do we prepare for what we've seen on film out of Leo, or do we expect something different, not drastically different? They're not going to come out five wide. But are they going to make some adjustments to what they do to try to counter what East Noble was able to stop last year? So two of the best coaches in the area, Luke Amstutz on one side and Jared Souter on the other, I think are playing mental games right now, going what direction do we go in terms of our scheme? And I think if you're Leo, you take a look at the physical advantage that they have along the offensive line. You've got, you know, DJ Allen, you've got yeah. Landon Livingston, and those aren't the only guys that they've got. I mean, they've got a beefy line um, yeah. that has experience. How do you take advantage of that if you're Leo? Okay, they shut our run game down last year, but man, look at the horses that we've right. got up front. Mason Sharon's healthy this year. He's breaking off big runs every week. They have a more powerful and more versatile running attack than they did a year ago. They do. And, you know, the, the point that you keep hearing from Leo fans is, as we say, look, eventually you're going to have to throw the football. And they say, well, not if nobody can stop it, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the onus, once again, for Leo is being able to establish that run game on Friday night. Can East Noble counter it? Or is the bulk up front just too much? For the night, so I think that's uh, you know a point of emphasis going into Friday night is if Leo can establish the run like they've been able to the first four weeks of the season, then East Noble's in trouble. But if East Noble is able to counter and put them into second longs, third and longs, and force Jackson Barber to go vertical, is that advantage East Noble at that point? All right, let's move on to the SAC, where because of of last week, it's always been interesting this year, <laughs> but because of last week's Homestead win at Bishop Dwenger, it's gotten more interesting. Where yeah. there are 
not just one game each week that has a major impact on the SAC, but I think multiple games uh, from here in and here out. We're talking about Carroll at Bishop Dwanger this week, Snyder at Homestead. Those are the two games we're keying on in the SAC. Let's start with Carroll at Bishop Dwanger because uh, Dwanger needs a bounce back game. They do. Uh, after the Homestead loss at Shields Field. And then you take a look at Snyder, didn't play last week. How is that going to impact them as they take on a Homestead team that obviously is feeling pretty good yeah. um, coming off the win against the Saints? And, and you take a look at the SAC standings, those are four teams that are still on the hunt for the SAC championship. Yeah, you hit on it because these are two elimination games, basically. If you suffer your second loss in the SAC, you're out of the conference race in terms of a title at this point. So you're looking at four one-loss teams cannot afford to get a second uh, you look at Carroll, and, you know, apart from week one, they're looking pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, hindsight's, is, you know, undefeated, but you think, man, they may have given, you know, Bishop Lures arguably one of their best games outside of Homestead. So I don't think we can write off Carroll, and I think when you look at Bishop DeWanger, maybe that final score last week wasn't indicative of just how lopsided that football game was, especially in the second half. And, and you know, I think Bishop DeWanger has some significant growth to do because you look at that at that squad and it's just not as biz, as big and physically imposing as it usually is, particularly on the defensive side of the football. Mm-hmm. They're quick, they're fast, they fly to the ball, but up front is still, um, if you cannot get a push, which they really consistently weren't able to against Homestead, that can be everything. And once again against Carroll, they're going to have to find a way to do that. I want to talk a little more about Snyder at Homestead, because if you're Homestead, how impressive has it been that you lose the, the over the last two years, you've graduated such a talented cast of characters and you take a look at you know obviously Nate Anderson is back and he's a big part of what they do but they replaced basically the offensive line this year which is huge in the SAC especially when you take on quality opponents and then you replace the quarterback again I mean they've had they put in a lot of new faces this year you know person is back there defensively I mean they've got a lot of new guys this year but yet they've been able to continue to have that success conversely Snyder how much uh, juice do they have coming off a week I mean I know those guys wanted to play a football game the game against Southside's canceled. Is it beneficial? Um, it's kind of the rest versus rust question right. mark heading into this game. And no one really truly knows the answer to that question until Friday, including Snyder coaches. They're going to prepare their guys, but two weeks off, it can be a benefit or it can be a detriment for sure. When you look at Homestead, the personnel changes, but one thing that doesn't is their ability to dominate up front or at least have the capability of doing that. And they were able to do that against Bishop Tewanger last week. And, you know, when you look at Dwanger and their bugaboo the last couple years is big, physical, tough offensive lines, not just in the conference, but in the playoffs as well. And so Homestead has that. Um, They have an anchor in the middle of that defense, too, that really forces things from, Mm -hmm. you know, from the nose outward where their linebackers can clean it up and their edge guys. So, you know, we may not know all these guys outside of Nate Anderson. And, you know, they were missing Desmond Smith last night or last week, which was I think was a big loss for them. Mm-hmm. But when you were able to establish the front and dominate in the trenches or at least play even in the trenches, it opens up a lot of things. And Homestead, maybe more than anybody else in the conference now over the last couple of years, is able to do that. Let's move on to the ACAC, uh, where just like in the NE8, it has become clearer and clearer yep. that we're looking towards one game to see who wins the, S- the ACAC championship. And that, of course, will be week six, South Adams battling Adams Central. Uh, Adams Central um, coming off a win against Park Heritage. They go down Jay County, no problem with Jay yeah. County last week. Uh, Adams Central taking on Heritage this week at AC. While South Adams, this is an interesting one, South Adams is at Monroe Central. You're talking about if you look at the AP poll, 1A in uh, the number one in 1A versus number four in 1A. If you don't follow Monroe Central yeah. football, they've been a really solid football program over the last four or five years. These are two very familiar opponents as well. How do you see this one playing out? Because it will be South Adams biggest test to this point in the season and a good barometer of where they are leading up to the AC game. Yeah, no doubt. Back-to-back big games for South Adams week five and week six, both on the road. They got to go to Monroe Central this week. They go to Monroe next week to face the Flying Jets at the landing strip. So this is when it gets real for South Adams. They've been able to hide, I want to say deficiencies, but the fact that they're missing last week, they missed Trey Schott. Mm -hmm. Plattner's out still. And, of course, Aiden Warner. They've been able, you know, Owen Warner has stepped in admirably. They've had other guys step up. Silas Loge for for wide receiver, and we're going, who the heck is that? A.J. Dole at running back, Mm -hmm. who the heck is that? 
these guys have been able to fill in admirably, but against admittedly inferior opponents. Now you face Monroe Central and Adam Central, two arguably the top five teams in Class 1A. Mm -hmm. Can these guys step up and do it? So, yeah, absolutely a big barometer game for Coach Mosier's team this Friday. And for Adam Central, I think one of the things, you, you, we talked about it with Leo, because you think AC, you think just running and pounding the yeah. football, Blake Hirely, Ryan Black, all those guys. Um, but they've thrown the foot when they've had to. This is the difference between yeah. some of the AC teams that they've had in the past. When they've had to throw the football, they've been pretty good at it. Right. Like you saw that last drive against Eastside when they needed to move the football yeah. down the field quickly. Ryan Black completed two, three, you know, chunk yardage plays. Like they can throw it too if yeah. they have to. They don't do it all the time, but when they've been asked to and when they've had to dial it up, they've been able to do it. Right. And I think that's the key for Adam Central not just to win an ACAC championship, but also have a deep postseason run because they can be offensively balanced when they need to. And I'm not talking about, you know, rushing the ball for 250 and throwing it for 300. I'm saying being enough of an offensive threat vertically to keep defenses honest. You're seeing Ryan Black develop very good rapport with Brayson Yergler, his tight end, who's been kind of that guy mm -hmm. that, that he looks to in the passing game. When you mix in that running attack and then you're able to – keep defenses off balance by doing a play action or a rollout and completing passes downfield, that's when you truly feel like a balanced offense capable of going deep in the postseason. Because in the year 2021, I just don't know if you can be an absolute one-sided offense and win a state championship. I feel like you have to at some way mix in some pass. I don't think you can just be run heavy. We've seen Eastbrook make it to the state championship yeah. multiple times over the last few years, but really just run heavy, and once that gets stopped, it's problematic against the Western yeah, Boons and some absolutely. of the other teams uh, that can score very quickly. I mean, uh, asked Leo about it last yeah, year, right? For, very much so. Uh, let's touch on the NECC. you got Garrett at East Side. These are two of the top three teams, yeah. maybe, in the NECC. Also want to give a shout-out to Central Noble there at Fremont. Central Noble, the Hayden Kilgore, baby. whatever Hayden Kilgore's got <laughs> cooking down there, it's working. They're 4-0 and and traveling to a 2-2 two and -two Fremont team, so... Um, that should be interesting, but Garrett at Eastside, Garrett with a, um, a nice bounce back win. Uh, how do you see this one playing out? Because Eastside again, we saw them get challenged by Busket. It was only a 2013 game last week on the road. Right. Yeah. And you know that was a Garrett team that you know if they're able to beat Chera Busco a couple weeks ago, which all of a sudden we're looking at Busco being a really solid football team. Mm -hmm. so we're talking a battle of undefeateds here. Uh, but Garrett was able to bounce back last week. You know, Aiden Lytle. Uh, the sophomore quarterback continues to grow there. Uh, you know, Trey Richards has been phenomenal for them, you know, on both sides of the football. But it comes down to Laban Davis. You know, he's huge. He's, he's good for 300 total yards per game at least, you know, on, on running and passing. Is can he continue to lead this football team? I feel really comfortable with them in the NECC. But the more I watch them and, you know, we're, we're once again, you know, feeling like it's going to be Lures East Side round three potentially in that yeah. sectional is does – East side have the horses to keep up with Bishop Lures. And I think as good as that win last week against Cherubusco was, you're kind of looking at that and going, what does Bishop Lures do to Cherubusco? And I know the goals for East side are much more than just winning mm -hmm. the division in the NECC. So as the weeks go on, I need to see more and more dominance out of East side to really give them a credible shot to knock off the Knights. And I think, uh, as you as you noted, um, when you take a look at the, the post game and the, what they think about uh, what Todd Mason says after <laughs> the game yeah. against, you know, Adam Central and after the game against Mesco, we hung around to get posts from those guys. That message was the same. It's yeah. like, yeah, okay, we won this. Great, we pulled it out. But guys, like, our goal is, is bigger than this game, yeah. is bigger than even a conference championship. Like, we have to get ready to play a team like Lures in the postseason. I, and I don't think that's lost on these guys. Right. And I think you hear Todd Mason keep reminding them. You, and, and this is why Todd Mason is, is stressing it this so, so much. And I don't want to take anything away from the underclasses at Eastside, but that senior group, mm -hmm. that's the group, right? Laban Davis and his teammates that are seniors. Tyler Bibby, all those That's days. the group, right, that we've seen come up, and they've had great players the last couple of years. But after this, yeah, you have Dax Holman and some other guys. But by and large, this is the last, at least for a little bit, really ultra talented senior group that they have. Todd Mason knows that this is it, right? And 
Fortunate or unfortunately, you could say, is they got Bishop Lewers in that sectional. Mm -hmm. But got them a couple of years ago, that great game last year in the sectional, you know, round three potentially this year. He knows his team has to execute at a higher level to have a shot against Bishop Lewers. They need to start doing that because, as you said, we're the halfway point of the year. You mm -hmm. only have, you know, at least, you know, four weeks until the postseason. Who knows? You may draw Bishop Lewers right out the gate. Yeah, yeah. We could be we, we could be right there. I mean, yeah. knocking on the door. Yeah, right. All right. So for week five of Inside the Zone, he's Justin Kenny of Optimum Performance Sports. I'm Glenn Marini, and we'll see you back here next week.